Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Hong Kong New Library this afternoon. I uh, guess most of you should have lunch or not. Yes? If not, uh, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, you uh, know our Gray. <laughs> we don't want to call him in a different name. Gray is the most intimate name. So uh, we are very privileged to have Gray with us today to talk about reading. So, great, may I pass the time to you, and then we'll go through this very um, wonderful journey. And afterwards, I will tell everybody how to make use of this uh, sheet. And uh, one of the sheets, if you would like to fill out for uh, our competition, uh, that's a very interesting activity to promote reading. We are now uh, asking everybody to help us do a voting. Uh, for the best idea you think can help the libraries promote reading. And if you like to make a vote, please do so. And we have the pens with us, and uh, if you want one, uh, you can get one, or otherwise make use of your pen and write down uh, one, only one idea from this sheet. And we'll collect it uh, from you during the talk. And then we'll announce the uh, result of this competition at the end of the talk. So, may I pass the time to Ray now? Thank sure. you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, so, be sure you have a pen of some sort, because you'll have to write just very, very short things. And also, I'm not sure Esther mentioned that there are big prizes for this contest. <laughs> so, uh, don't forget to jot down your choice. Uh, I want to thank the library in uh, Hong Kong Libfest. Um, Common Core for just supporting not just this event but reading series and reading talks across the year. Uh, I love to read, <clears throat> I like to think about reading, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you um, so that we can do that as a kind of provisional community that will come together today and disperse and then regather at certain moments. Um, so, I just want to mention this curling up with the infinite back sheet, because that's the one you'll be writing just a bit on. Uh, I'm, I'm not interested in me standing up here and pretending to be an expert very much. I think we're all amateurs of reading, and the word amateur comes from the word love. Amo, amas, amat, for all you Latin scholars out there. So I think we're all lovers of reading, and then how do we begin together to think about that? I love to read, but I also like to think about what reading is, what reading does, what it may not be able to do, and that kind of thing. So uh, it's called Curling Up with the Infinite. And I hope you looked at that title and said, those professors, <laughs> what does that mean? Okay, so we'll talk about those words. How, I wonder, has reading changed our lives? So I want you not to be listening too closely to me, but to be thinking about your own life and your own life of reading. Don't worry, I'll keep droning on, but be thinking... The brain is complex. Think about your own experience. As friends of the delights and difficulties of reading, so reading is delightful and reading can be difficult. And I'll share some difficult lines with you in just a bit. We will share with one another about where and what we like to read. So, you know, be thinking about where you most like to read. What are your favorite haunts for reading? and the posture of your body. Okay. And we'll talk about what also, <clears throat> about the magic of childhood and the perils of navigating reading in adulthood. So think about yourself as a child and yourself as an adult and the different habits that you have about as a reader and the different purposes you have as a reader, but maybe not altogether different. Yeah. Come on in. About the poetics of reading. So, what does that strange word poetics mean? 
What is, what is your own theory of reading? What do you think reading is and does? Are all of you okay in the back or do you need to move up? There's a pink section and a mustard colored section. I think these are meaningless, but I'm not sure. Feel free to move anytime you'd like to. Hello. About the poetics of reading and the shared idiosyncrasies of our reading preferences. I like that word, idiosyncrasy. Everybody in this room has a different type of reading that you like to do, and that's great. So, you know, in universities, we tend to move towards <clears throat> a predominant type of reading, but I want to keep our idiosyncrasies very much in our minds. What are the peculiarities of your, your reading lists? and about the wealth of possibilities that reading creates. So this, <clears throat> this talk, the whole theory of the Hong Kong Lip Fest is reading creativity. And so already you're in touch with these trajectories and impulses of yours that are creative. And so I want to think with you about how we move more deeply into that kind of space. Okay, so please notice this, this handsome fellow, he's curled up. I'm just making this up, I don't know if it's true. That's an early iPad, um, or maybe it's just a pillow. Okay, so caring, collaborative, creative, your partner in intellectual excellence. We all have to do these brandings for libraries and the Common Core and all that kind of thing. But this is a fantastic image of thinking about curling up with the infinite. So, curling up. Two things to start with. One, when you were a kid, where did you like to curl up and read? Was there a, a bed? Was there a hammock? Was there a comfy chair? I don't know. But where was it that you like to curl up. And then, I'll add to that, think about curling up as the form of a question mark. So what questions as a kid and as an adult do you have about your own reading practice? How is it that reading itself is a question? And then, the infinite. I have no idea what that is. So I'll probably ask all of you to explain to me what curling up with the infinite means, but don't get nervous. Um, <clears throat> all I'll say right now is it's in, and then it's connected to the finite. That's, that's limitation, which we all are, and that's a kind of releasing towards something, some other experience, that is not disconnected from limitation. I'm beginning to confuse myself, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide. Philosophy books. How many of you love to read philosophy? Anybody? One and a half, two and a half, three and a half. <laughs> Okay, so be thinking what philosophy is. Everybody here has a philosophy. All of you do philosophy all the time because you think about your jobs and you think about your lives and your families and your careers. So we're all philosophers, but we wanted to start with just a bookshelf. And I will not ask you how many of you have spent hours in the bookshelves lately because our media habits are changing. But anyway, this is from images from the library. Beginning philosophy. There's no such thing as any other position except beginning philosophy. We can only always begin philosophy. Like, you're going to wake up tomorrow, right? And you're going to ask yourself the same questions. Why am I doing this? <laughs> what should I do today? Who do I care about? What is the most important task for me and my children or my siblings or my parents or whatever? 
So we have to just keep beginning. That's part of the infinite. Beginning, beginning, beginning. Okay? Culture and modernity. Let's, uh, let's leave that for another day. Uh, and philosophy goes to the movies. Anybody seen any movies lately? Yes. I spend most of my nights streaming Netflix. Terrible, terrible habit. Esther wants me to read more. Um, but what is philosophy doing at the movies? Okay. That's a blue frame. Beginning with words. Uh, okay, so we're talking about reading. And so we have to think about words and language. And here's our word again, beginning. So think back. When did you begin with words? When did you first learn to talk? You do not remember that moment. Nonetheless, here we are, and we're able to do something called talk. So speech and reading might be related. It, but reading cannot be thought about except through language in some way or another, and that's complicated. Okay? So what, and I apologize. I'm, I wish I knew Cantonese and Mandarin and about 40 other languages. Uh, so, but I don't. So you should be thinking in all of the languages that you know, Norwegian and whatever, about what does reading do? Okay, so here's an etymology. Etymologies are tricky, right? The origins of words, because the origins of words always have to be in words, and these words go back to other words. When did it start? We can figure that out next week. And I'm not going to even read through all these. I just want to say the words in red. All of these are related to the way that the English word reading develops. Riddle. Fantastic word. So how for you is reading a riddle? And how does reading pose riddles for you? Enigma. Same thing. Those words actually go back to the same Greek, Greek term. Um, what is an enigma? An enigma is a question. We're curling up with the infinite, and curling up is, is becoming a question mark. Order. Interesting term. So when you think about a book or a text, it has order, right? How does that order operate? Um, how do you intersect with this order of words that somebody else has created? And uh, how does the order of those words relate to what's going on in the world? Counsel. We need counsel from books, poems, plays. So how do you turn to books for counsel? Which books do you turn to when you're disturbed or depressed or confused? Um, <laughs> those cameras are so great. But I'll try to just act naturally. <laughs> um, yeah, so how do books give you advice? Right? And all of you have some favorite book that gives you advice. It would be interesting to think about and talk about. Interpret. Lots and lots to say about this very strange word, interpretation. But how do you interpret text? You don't do it consciously most of the time, right? When you sit down to read a book, you don't say, oh, now I'm going to interpret. No, you just read. But that's a very sophisticated activity you've learned to do over many, many years. And it, it carries with it enormous parts of your experience, which are not immediately available, but they're there to be thought about. But when you use the word interpret, you have to start thinking about what you're doing. Um, you don't have to do that, but if you start talking about interpretation, you, you will do that. To account for, how does reading account for? That seems like an ethical or a moral term. How do we account to each other? How do we account to the world? How does reading help you account for yourself or to tell the story of yourself? How is your story related to the story of reading and to gather? That comes from this, that last part, the Latin legere, which 
So reading gathers together. If we're curling up with the infinite, how does reading gather things together? Okay. How does it assemble? Hmm. How does it assemble for you? Okay. So that's just a start. Thanks to Esther and CUHK's library, this is reading and creativity. Um, and I'm told that the written form and the spoken form are different, and I begin to get confused. Um, but look at that list. And when was the last time you looked at these characters or the concepts and thought about, well, what's included here? So inspection, examination, searching, observing, review, that's all reading. Different types of reading, different moments of reading, but they're all gathered together in this concept. And to accommodate, accommodate's a lovely word. It's capacious. It's beautiful. How do we accommodate ourselves? How do we accommodate each other? Okay, study, read. For each of you, do you like to study or do you hate to study? Do you sometimes like to study and sometimes hate to study? What is the relationship of study? Here we are in this fantastic library in a new space, in a university. If you go and do a survey of the students out there and say, how many of you really like to study, especially now that their exams are coming up? Maybe not, but okay. So to create reading creativity, what does it mean for you in a very, very modest way to create something? What does it mean to create something when you're reading? Uh, and reading, we'll, we'll get to it, it has many implications. To make, to invent, to begin, how is it possible in this world that there's something new under the sun? And it is possible, and we all know that newness occurs, so how does that relate to reading? When you read a new book, how do you possibly know how to do that? It's a different world opening up for you. Okay? And then the next ones are the most interesting. Wound, cut, and punish. How is reading at, in any way, shape, or form related to being wounded? Is that related to your age as a kid or as an adult? How does reading cut into us and wound us at the same time that it sort of gives us this accommodation towards a type of response to being wounded? One little thing, when we read a book, we realize how, much, how little we know, right? There's a whole library right outside the door. None of us have done much with that. How can we do more? So we're wounded by our Finitude, to go back to that for just a minute, but not to stay with that. Idea, opinion, sediment. Sedimentation is interesting. Think about the psychology of your reading. Think about your many, many multiple selves that are gathered together in a moment of reading. And if you can figure out your many, many multiple selves and how they're connected to each other, please write me a quick email. Um, so reading is mysterious, I would say. It's very, very, very familiar. We don't think about it when we do it. But if you start thinking about it, you're in trouble. I would recommend don't think about reading. Because then you're going to go, oh my goodness, I don't know quite what I'm doing. It's a very bad moment. So if you want to leave now, that's fine. That, they made a good decision. <laughs> OK, thought, meaning, wish. How do those relate? Thought, meaning, wish. We'll have to come back to this very, very problematic word, meaning. I hate that word. Will, purpose, desire, intention, suggestion, hint, and trace. And pay attention to hint and trace. How does reading give you a hint? What is it hint about? How is it a series of traces? Um, what does it mean to trace something? What does it mean to track something down? Okay, so all I wanted to do so far is just to complicate the situation. So far, so good? Excellent. Okay. Lines from a page. So basically, a little thinking together, a teeny tiny bit of reading, and then I'll ask you to jot down a word or two and talk to each other. Okay?
How many have read this book, Atlas? Uh, Hong Kong writer, award winner, fantastic book. So I, I recommend it highly. Um, it's called The Archaeology of an Imaginary City. The imaginary city is called Victoria, but it's Hong Kong. Okay. <clears throat> It's, it's all about maps. The most striking and thought-provoking part of the map is an area to the north outlined with a dotted line along the harbor side. So talking about Victoria Harbor, sort of. <clears throat> if we accept Roland Barthes' reading of photographs as put forward in Camera Lucido, we should then not exclude it from map reading. We don't know what that means, but he's this famous French semiotician. And we will have the word semiotics in just a minute. You can look it up on Google Translate. Okay? Even our eyes are thus often struck by some indescribable punctum. It seems to me that the dotted line in the water is such a punctum. All that means is when you look at a map, or when you look at a photograph, any photograph, what draws your attention? What intrigues you about a photograph, a map, or a book? That's the punctum. That's the point around which you are beginning to get organized and which intrigues you. That's a hint, that's a trace, that's a potential wound, and that's a very interesting moment. So he's just sort of referring to these other writers. That's one thing that I want to just underline is <clears throat> this, I don't know what to call this genre, but let's just say fiction, but it has everything to do with the reality of Hong Kong. So we're going to start mixing types of writing, which he does very explicitly here. He finishes this chapter with this <clears throat> short sentence. Fiction is the essential character of Victoria. Fiction, what do we mean by that? Essential character of Victoria, i.e. Hong Kong. And that will make us nervous at some level and intrigue us at some other level, even all cities. So every city is fundamentally fictional. What? Don't tell urban planners and real estate people that. Don't tell the civic uh, engineers that. Okay? So this is a question. City maps are by necessity novels expanding. So when you look at a map, even Google Maps, that's a novel. You look at the map, you find a point of interest, and it expands. Our by necessity novels expanding, altering, embellishing, and repudiating themselves. Expanding, okay, think about reading. Expanding, mm -hmm. altering, mm -hmm. embellishing, yeah, sure, and repudiating. That's a harder one. How does reading repudiate itself? Okay. Fantastic book. Short, short chapters, good nighttime reading, okay? So that's one, lines from a page. Okay, I want you to now, I'm, I get bored of myself speaking very, very quickly. So I'd like you to just write a couple things on your page of notes. Where did you most like to read? So what was the place as a kid that you most enjoyed reading? And did you ever read with the flashlight under the covers or some other new micro machine that digitally lights up? Okay, so that's one thing. And secondly, what did you most like to read as a kid? So this is story time one, curling up as a child. Okay, so take really a minute and a half and jot down some notes for yourself. There is no exam. Yeah, sure. Yeah, just anywhere on that one page you have is fine. The, the note.
Anybody need a pen? Okay. Okay, everybody have something written down? Uh, please turn to a neighbor and share where did you most like to read and what did you most like to read with whoever you're sitting next to. And, and if you're in one row, just <laughs> turn around and find, find some companions. Yeah. So where did you most like to read and what? You guys can move around if you need to. It's so cute. Oh my gosh. It's very exciting to lay. Okay, 30 seconds. Okay, is that enough for right now? Did everybody just have a quick chance? Okay, so what we're doing, we're sort of catalyzing our internal space of memory. So you weren't thinking ahead of time about this, now we are, and there's enormous liveliness in the rooms and in your heads. Okay, so uh, let's move on. I don't know about this one. Um, more lines from a page. This is a really, really difficult French philosopher named Gilles Deleuze, okay? So I wanted to read it. We read, you know, a, a local Hong Kong writer. Uh, we started with philosophy. I wanted to just look at a teeny tiny bit of this to indicate that, that reading is difficult and that it's not masterable in a certain way. What I should do is ask you to just to, to name a page, and I'll read that, and we'll shrug our shoulder and say, I have no idea what that's about. But I decided not to do that. <laughs> so this is called the logic of sense, or you can translate it as the logic of meaning. So when you read, or when you talk, there's meaning going on, right? Most of the time. How does that happen? What is your theory of how you make sense? That's the kind of sense he's talking about. How do things make sense? And make is important in that sense. Okay, so you do not have to remember a line of this, a word of this. Please don't. Please try to forget everything that I'm going to read for the next 30 seconds. Um, Atlas talked about a French semiotician. Okay. This is a philosophy book, but listen to how it starts. The work of Lewis Carroll. Who is Lewis Carroll? Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland. Oh my God, this is going to be bad. I thought I was going to read philosophy, but he wants me to go read Alice in Wonderland. And believe me, he takes it seriously. Okay? So, I'm late. I'm late for a very important date. All those games, okay. The work of Lewis Carroll has everything required to please the modern reader. Children's books, or rather books for little girls, splendidly bizarre and esoteric words, the Jabberwocky, Twas Brilligan, the Slithy Toads, the Gyre and Gimble and the Wobby, all Mimsy where the bird grows, and the Momorats outcrop it. 
Who knows? He's making up words. Okay? Don't worry, this doesn't go on too long. Okay. Grids, codes, and decodings. Drawings and photographs. We like illustrated books. We like graphic novels. We like comic books. A profound psychoanalytic content. Who cares? We'll leave that aside. And an exemplary logical and linguistic formalism. Aha! So just, that's one sentence. And he's gone from Alice in Wonderland to logic and formalisms. Now we do think, maybe I'm in philosophy, and I'm going to put this down and go have a cup of tea. Okay. Uh, over and above the immediate pleasure, though, okay, immediate pleasure of reading Alice in Wonderland. Yay, great. But over and above that, what's going on? There is something else. This book could have been called The Logic of the Something Else. But a play, okay, so like, you know, your steering wheel plays, it moves. When you play games, there's a play of sense and nonsense. Okay, so he's already diving in to the relationship between sense and nonsense, starting with Alice in Wonderland and writing another 400 pages. Don't recommend it. Okay, so here's his thesis sentence. We present here a series of paradoxes which form the theory of sense. That's not good news. How do things mean for you? How do you make sense of things? It's a paradox. Uh-oh. A paradox is going to be confusing. It is easy to explain why this theory is inseparable from paradoxes. Sense is a non-existing entity and, in fact, maintains very special relations with nonsense. And then he goes on to talk about Alice in Wonderland and these early Greek and Roman philosophers called the Stoics who were very, very interested in how do we, how do we create meaning for ourselves? How does language create sensibility? Okay? So, just, that's philosophy. We have fiction. We have philosophy. We have our idiosyncrasies of reading. All of you don't like to read this stuff, which is good. Do not start reading this stuff if you can avoid it. There's lots of better things to read. Alice in Wonderland's okay, but not philosophy. Okay? Because you're going to get wounded, and that's no fun. Okay. So, other parts of the library. We should do a scavenger hunt next time and have people go find these books. Can they win a yacht if they do that? <laughs> You can imagine some more. She's not going to give you a yacht, though. Okay. So how does reading work? We've already talked about it, and you've all formulated your stuff already. So this is just repetition. It multiplies things. When you sit down to read, your world is multiplied. You know more when you get up than when you sat down. So reading is multiplication. It compresses things. All you have is a little book in front of you. But Alice in Wonderland, or Wizard of Oz, or the Tao Te Ching, whatever, it compresses the world into these little books. That's weird. It's multiplication, it's compression, it's expansion, we already said that, and it scales. It can t be talking about the color of this carpet, which is just brilliant. Uh, or it could be talking about the way the cosmos works. Okay? It depends on what you want your reading to do. Okay, it enables us to experience meaning, whatever that is, via an organized structure of language. That's a text, or that's a conversation. So if you experience reading as a text or a conversation, you experience meaning. Yep, yep, how does that happen? Reading enables us to interpret everyday scenarios. When you came in and you saw me up here, did anybody freak out and say, what's going on? No. Because you know what's going on. Speaker, microphone, jacket, clicker. Aha, I can read this scenario. We know how to read everyday life, and we do it constantly. That's good. But what does it mean that it's a form of reading? Okay, so I'm moving a little away from text. Um, the, the contours of our lives and the cosmos. We'll leave off the cosmos right now. But when you say to yourself, Okay, what is the next chapter of my life going to be? 
that's a weird thing. Is your life a book? It must be if it has a next chapter. Or, this is my journey of learning. What? Learning is a journey? No, it's not. It's just sitting around reading. Uh, this chapter is coming to an end. Okay, so we organize the way we think about our lives as a narrative. And your narrative will be of all different sorts, of course, although we have some cliches to use on occasion. And then finally, this is a really simple one. It's a fundamental relationship with space-time. What does that mean? It means when you read, you, mem you remember stuff. This is really simple. You know, professors say really simple things in very complicated ways, and it's a, it's a terrible habit. When you sit down to read, you remember stuff, and you project yourself ahead. That's what space-time is, and you're doing it in the present. So some other time, we can talk about the relationships between these things, but reading is a time travel machine. A book is a time travel machine, and time is always related to space. That was fun. Okay, so your turn to write again. As an adult, now this is you right now. What books are by your bedside? What books are piled in the living room? And how will you decide where to begin to read those books? Okay, so just another one and a half minutes, just jot things down really quickly. You're creating a text. Where are the books in your flats or your houses? Okay, so once again, just turn to the person next to you and, and tell them where your books are. It's a kind of an intimate question, right? Okay, so quick reminder and then back to this. Esther, you want to just talk about the four? Yeah, uh, by the way, because some of you uh, might arrive a little bit late, so uh, we got one, one whole set of documents for you to fill out. Actually, uh, apart from the sheet you were just talking about, we have another voting sheet. And uh, if you could help us to pick one idea from that sheet, and we'll collect it after your dis discussion, and we'll announce the uh, result of our competition for uh, reading promotion ideas among the Hong Kong youth community. So please help us to pick one idea. Thank you. Uh, please pass the, the, uh, the sheet completed. I think Melissa's going to take yeah. up the Thank forms. Thank you very much. And they're really big prizes, so be sure you do yeah. this. <laughs> okay, so where, where are your books? Um, Peter, where are your books? Hi, uh, hi everybody, I'm Peter. Uh, my books are in a, on a little table next to the bed. So I live in a small room, so that's the only place they could actually be. Uh, how are you going to decide what to read next? I decide day by day. Okay. 
depends on how I feel about a certain subject. Yeah. yeah, that's important to decide day by day, moment by moment. You know, you look at a pile of books in the morning and you say, I'm going to read three of those by the end of the day. And then you get home and you're tired and you don't really want to read those. So you change your mind. Where are your books? Uh, recently, I had a book uh, about uh, religious uh, Paul, he, uh, his journey starting from Turkey to other places. Yeah. Okay, so sort of the journeys of St. Paul, <clears throat> and where and where is it next to your bed or in the living room? Living room, different kinds of book. Okay, fantastic. So living room? Actually, it's funny because I've just read something on Turkey, uh, Byzantium, history of Byzantium, oh. because I went to Turkey on the way. Fantastic. And where in your flat? Sorry? Where, what room is it in? Uh, the sitting room. Okay, the sitting room. So the history of Byzantium, fantastic. That city has had quite a history. Fantastic poems by W.B. Yeats about uh, Byzantium. And now what we're doing, you mentioned Paul in Turkey, and then you went on holiday. Now we're forming reading groups, and we're forming schools of reading. The famous Turkish Byzantium Pauline School of Reading, which began at Hong Kong U on October 31st, okay? You're going to suddenly find connections with other people about what you're reading. Where are your books? About <laughs> wow. Okay. And where in your flat? Just what room? Which room? Yeah. <laughs> everywhere. Your friend knows you very well. Are, you have books everywhere? Yeah. Fantastic. Me too. Okay. So you pile books up. Great. Tina? about where are your books? So I have some books in my sitting room as well as in the bedroom. But I don't read in the bedroom. I always read in the sitting room. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So that's where you like to, so to speak, curl up. In this, yes. Is it a particular chair? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, mm. a sofa. A sofa. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. Sofas are great. Thank you. Anybody else want to share where your books are? You look like you're iPad? Yeah, that's that's absolutely the correct answer for many, many people, right? On your iPad. Where do you keep your iPad? In my bag right now. In your bag. So reading is portable in a different sense. It's always been portable except for early on, but now it's differently portable. Um, and how many books do you have any idea how many are on your iPad? More than 10. More than 10 and probably more than 10,000. So technology allows a new form of compression and expansion to go on in terms of you can carry around, I've got, you know, on my Kindle, I've got the history of philosophy. It's great. Do I ever read it? No. Um, okay, Any, anybody else about where you like to read? Because <clears throat> it matters where you feel comfortable. And this is why the library is so important for students. They really love comfortable places, both for ta taking naps, which is an important part of life, but also for reading and studying. Okay? Do I need two of these? Do I need two? <laughs> echo, 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 echo. Uh, there, there, yeah, there's another story with echo. But. Okay, so more books. Where are they? Where will you wander around after you leave here? There's a new exhibit space over there for sort of thematic exhibits, so wander by there and then see if you can get lost in the library so that Esther's team has to come find you. Um, we've asked, how does reading work? And we have some beginning answers to that, but now we're going to ask again. So reading is beginning, 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 never not beginning. And it's always repetition, repetition, repetition. But it's always repetition with a difference. So we have to think, how does reading work? Which means, how do you work? How do you interpret the world as you read? How does reading interpret you? We can tell a lot from each other and by each other about what our reading preferences are. And the fact that I like to read things like that first ridiculousness about Lewis Carroll and the paradoxes of sense, that says something. I don't know what it says. 
Okay. So what's that top symbol? An ampersand. And it just means and. So reading is always and, and, and. It's never either or. It's always a multiplier. It divides and it cuts in certain ways, but it's always for the sake of and, and, and. And it's not finishable, and it's not completable. Not a single book, not a single book is completable. That's part of what it means about infinity in terms of reading. There are many other ways we could talk about that. But you can reread. Have any of you ever reread a book before? Yes, everybody probably. That's important. Most books we don't care about enough to reread, and they don't, they don't deserve rereading. But some books, for all of us, have been read and reread and reread and then passed on down in some way or another. Okay, discipline and freedom. So it takes a lot of discipline to learn to read and to keep reading. It's a practice, and any practice takes discipline. We want to get better at it, and we can get better at reading. Okay? But that discipline gives us freedom. So the more you're able to play badminton at a higher level, the more freedom you have in the game. Same with reading. So practice, 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 but more and more moments of kind of an ecstasy, very quiet. Okay? The great pleasure of reading. Captivation and release. So the books that you love captivate you. That's interesting. How does a book captivate a person? You are drawn into that book. You are uh, invested in that book. You are moved by that book. So it captivates you. How does that happen? But it releases you to that which you want to be next. Okay? where it releases you to the next moment of reading or to rereading that same book. So there's a deep relationship between being captivated and being released. Um, genres and history, we, this is, all of these are huge topics, I apologize, but there are many different types of books that you like, all of which are fantastic. Um, and all of those types of books, we'll call them genres, have very complicated histories. And so you can always, like, I, I'm finishing up John le Carre's recent novel, uh, you know, the spy novelist. Big, big history there. Uh, I read philosophy. Big, big. So genre and history always go together, and that fits in with your desire. You like certain types of books more than others. That's fantastic. That will always be the case. Uh-oh. Professor words. Semiotics and hermeneutics. So we've seen the word semiotics when uh, Dung Kai Chung mentions Roland Barth, semiotics is just the study of signs. Signs are how, the, how meaning operates in the world. Like, what my jacket is a sign. What does my jacket mean? Well, if you know me, it means I have to perform in public. I don't wear jackets like this very often, but I'm happy to. Um, so everything you have on right now is a sign. Everything in this room is a sign. All that means is we look at things, we look at projectors and architectural forms and carpets, and it leads to something else. That's how meaning operates. One thing leads to another. Okay, that's simple. Hermeneutics is just a fancy word for that other word we talked about, interpretation. So Hermes, fantastic Greek god, was the god of communication and messages, but also he traveled from the heights of the gods abode down to Hades. So hermeneutics is that which travels. It's a theory of interpretation. Technically, it starts in the 18th century when biblical interpretation becomes moving toward the sciences of philology and archaeology and history and stuff like that. But then it becomes a more generalized theory. So, if you're bored tonight, you're tired of watching movies, just go read the history of hermeneutics. 
really, it'll keep you awake all night. Don't share it with your friends, because it'll keep them awake too. Uh, it's really a hot topic in the bars. Um, hey, what's your hermeneutical position? Uh, okay, taste and intellect. Taste is what you like. And we all have different tastes. Intellect is how you understand things. So reading is always a combination of these things. What you like and how you understand. Okay? Um, so lots more to think about that in terms of aesthetics and, and that kind of thing. Uh, memory and anticipation. We already talked about if reading is a space-time machine, then when you sit down, you're already remembering. You couldn't read if you didn't remember, by the way. You wouldn't know what a word was. You wouldn't know what a text was. You wouldn't know what, who you were 10 minutes ago. So memory is there, and you're always doing that to, to look ahead a little bit. Yeah. Uh, mem uh, solitude and communality. Is communality a word? I don't know. Is that a word? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. I agree. When you read, you read by yourself. But, and that's part of curling up, but there is no such thing as reading without a community immediately present. Because, how many of you taught yourself English and Chinese from about three months on? Nobody. You learn to speak from other people. Those people are there when you read. You have loads of teachers, some of which you hated, some of which you loved, but they're all there. They're your friends and your family. So reading is a space of communality, even if you're absolutely by yourself. Okay, bye-bye. Um, so I think we have to keep both of these sort of parts of the spectrum active. What does it mean to read by yourself? What does it mean to read in a community? Which is one of the reasons I think this reading series is a great idea. Because uh, it lets us bring our solitude to and toward each other. Okay? So, dialogos, that's another professorial thing. Dia means to. Logos is reading, intelligibility. So, reading is always a dialogical situation. It doesn't mean just you and your brain and somebody else. It's like speaking. It means your sofa, your book. Your iPad, it's always a scenario. And any point of that scenario is interesting to think about. Okay? So, dialogical, lots to think about that. Hang on one second, just don't want to. Okay. So, more lines from a page. Do I want to do that? Yeah, sure. Uh, this is a, a book called A Lobby by Mandy Suzanne Wong, who lives in Bermuda, and I won't read much of this, but <clears throat> the kanji for Awabi is a single double-sided character. The left side with the wispy tail means fish. The right side is itself two-sided, one side meaning self and the other embracing. The Awabi's nemesis and champion is the Ama. Ama is written with two characters, which are there. The first character is sea or ocean. Uh, it is only the second character in the Ma, the follower, or perhaps the verso of the first that means woman. So we get these two characters, the sea and a woman. Today, just over a thousand Ama remain in sleepy coastal villages and on Japan's outlying islands, eking out a living with their hands and lungs. These women still dive without weapons. They shun scuba gear and breathe like marine mammals. Nearly all are senior citizens. And so this little book is a story of a particular family. But I wanted to read this. One, it's just a lovely book. But secondly, because we've talked about genres and histories and types of reading. But it's very important to think about gender when we read, too. Um, you know, this has become a big topic in universities since, at least since the sort of late 60s. But what does it mean about what types of sensibilities we have circulating through reading and through writing? Uh, this one explicitly is exploring uh, the disappearance of a, a woman's culture, but it can go in many different dir uh, directions. <clears throat> so we, we could add to genre and history all these other questions that have been circulating in universities for a long time now. The Crafty Reader, nice title. What does crafty mean? 
Seems like a good thing, right? Maybe it just means cunning and sneaky. Reading the 21st century. Well, that's interesting. We can read a century. What does reading mean there? Through the eyes of a child. Hmm, is that possible? Or do you all, myself included, still see through our child's eyes? Or what don't we see anymore? Uh, and something to talk about. So which that brings us back to this question about what's the relationship between reading and speech and conversation? Okay, so we're back, circulating back to the beginning, curling up with the infinite. You reread books, you start books again, so there's a kind of a circular motion there, but you're always different at different points of your reading. So there's a kind of linear motion there. So reading is this, this is not going to make much sense maybe, it doesn't to me either, but I'm just making it up and I think it's right. Uh, reading is the intersection between the circular and the linear in terms of forms of time and experience. There you go. Um, curling up on your couch, in your chair, in your bed, on the floor, is a physical motion. Reading is purely physical. But we've also talked about how it relates to meaning making and sense making. And so this curling up is a question mark. And it's the word reflection, as, as you all know, comes from to bend back. Like light reflects, it bends back. So reading is always a reflective process, even if it's not very consciously reflective. So you always turn back towards something when you read. So curling up, for me, has all of those connotations, and I'm sure there are others that I'm, I'm forgetting. And with the infinite, again, that word is too big almost. But if, if we think about the finite, we're sitting here, tick, 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 time is going by, you're starting to dream about lunch, or dream about dinner, I'm getting hungry, uh, you know, I don't know enough, I have to go study, I don't have enough money, I'm limited, i got to go get another job. So the finite is, there's never a moment we're not experiencing that. We're limited, right? But we're always being opened up by reading to the slightly other, or the somewhere else, or the something else. That, so infinity does not mean infinite knowledge. It can't mean that. It doesn't mean infinite experience, except as a form of radical compression. And, um, <clears throat> and it doesn't mean absolute immeasurability. Uh, there's good infinity and there's bad infinity. And reading is good infinity. But it's always related to, I don't have enough time to read. How many of us have said that? I don't have enough, that's an interesting sentence. I say this to myself all the time, all the time. I say I don't have enough time. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, I wanted to just use this as a title to pose a question and to get us to think about this very, very ordinary activity of reading. Uh, and the ordinary, by the way, as you all know, is always extraordinarily interesting, but we have to think about it. Okay, so reading and the experience of infinity, just barely, barely, barely scratching the surface of that. Um, and on another time, I would be interested in what you mean by the word experience. So be thinking about that too. What does it mean for you to have an experience? Why do we use the word have there? Okay, one more thing on your pieces of paper. Reading as dreaming, story time three. So you've got to write one more thing. Are we okay with time? Okay. What book do you dream of writing? Okay. If you have never dreamed of writing a book, just make up something. Just make up a title and write it down. Okay? So jot down what book do you dream of writing. I see everybody's eyeballs going up toward the sky. <laughs>
this in, this in a way is a harder question, right? Because it doesn't depend on memory as much as on anticipation. And, yeah. Okay, everybody have something written down? Okay, just very briefly turn to your neighbor and say either what you want to write or just shake your head and say, I have no idea. That's okay, too. So just share really quickly with yourselves. <laughs> it's much quieter this time. <laughs> Okay, so you, if I ask you what you dream of writing, it's totally okay for you to say, not now. What do you dream of writing? Deep Yeah. Well, actually, just to select the newspaper for my interview, mm -hmm. then I will uh, steam my when I'm trial mm -hmm. the in, in the field, and now on, I have another interview to prove mm -hmm. for, my, for my life. Yeah, fantastic. Kind of in interviews as the growth of your life. That I, yeah, fantastic. So you're already thinking about genre. The interview as a genre, and how do you turn that into a story of your life? Great, great idea. How about you? I hope I can write something which inspires people. Fantastic. So. What, how do you write to inspire people? What inspires us? My definition of education is inspired pragmatism. So this inspiration is very important. Yes, uh, that we are the universe. We are the universe. Yeah, fantastic. Short book or long book? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right, an infinite book. Uh, we are the universe, excellent, thank you. I, I haven't actually given much thought to this before this workshop, but maybe something like a detective story or some sort. Yeah, fantastic. A detective story, and you haven't given it much thought. Well, nobody here has. I mean, that, that's great. So suddenly, what's a detective story? Um, I didn't think about the subject before, mm -hmm. then, but I worked as a kindergarten teacher, mm -hmm. and now I'm thinking maybe I can write down the stories of the children in my class and their parents. Yeah, fantastic book. That would be very inspiring. The story of the children and their parents. You would have multiple voices already operating there and you could do great pictures. Uh, any books come to mind? I didn't write down anything, but perhaps something that stayed positive throughout the difficult times. Yeah, yeah. All the books that we've all read how to stay positive when things are no good, or when we're struggling, or how to, uh, yeah, how to make sense of things and how to stay positive. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. No. Uh, a, a book about uh, one kind of dream, dreams. A, a book about dreams. Yeah, fantastic. Dreaming. How many of you have ever had a dream? You should think about those dreams and what structure they have. Yeah, we'll do that later. Uh, just like some relates to a bunch of stories, like some uh, Harry Potter's. Harry Potter. Who's Harry? Yeah. <laughs> so Harry Potter, we, we all know that name, right? She just, she was broke. She was struggling, a single mom. And she is now a queen of Harry Potter. So good luck and let us know. The Common Core needs your money when you make. Okay. So 
I like the fact, and I appreciate it, that you said, I hadn't thought about this before, because that's what reading gives us the opportunity to do, too. It's like, huh, I could do this. I, you know, I am the universe. We are the universe. Dreaming, positivity, inspiration, kindergarten kids, all that stuff. Okay, so that's what I mean by reading creates possibilities. Um, so I'm going to end with a, a page of my own because I want to take responsibility for my own writing. Uh, I hate it when I have to do that. <laughs> so this is from a book called Night Cafe, which is a painting by Vincent Van Gogh. The amorous notes of a barista. Amorous means erotic. So this is a really spicy book. Uh, the erotic notes of a barista. Ask the Starbucks people if they have amorous notes. It's about cafes. So the last page is called Midnight. Enough then of Rilke. Rilke is a famous poet. Enough of history and painting, of Gaji and Papa, that's Ernest Hemingway, of shotguns and nuclear accidents. Enough of the ghost, all the voices chattering like birds in a great tree. Enough of the bees, enough of Orpheus. It's done, it's finished. I'll take the whiskey and coffee over to the scarred wooden table and pull my chair to the door to where cobblestone meets wood. I'll step inside the Café de la Terrasse, which is another of Van Gogh's paintings. Come the hard rain, the snow, or the bright clarity of the stars, I'll be open to the weather. The night is quiet, the revelers have passed, I greet without consolation this immeasurable darkness. Tonight, for as long as the night lasts, I'll breathe in the cold night air. I'll see who drops by for a last, or perhaps even a first, copita. I'll wait on this threshold for as long as is necessary. I'll let the night flow into every corner of the cafe, and out through the door into every corner of the world. I will welcome any stranger who happens by. Come, sit with me. We'll wait here together in the night, musing in the dark. That was excellent timing. <laughs> uh, so I like this word, musing in the dark. That's another of my definitions of reading. That you're musing with the muses, these these spirits of creativity, <clears throat> but it's always in a kind of darkness. So here's my admonition to everybody. Go read. Once upon a time, we curled up. The book was opened. The first page was slowly turned. And... So... We have one more event to do, um, but I want to thank you for your attention and for your own reading. That's the most important thing. Just keep reading, wander through the library to find your spots, <clears throat> and always have a special place to curl up. So I think with that, if I understand what's supposed to happen next, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Ian Holliday uh, to the stage. Ian's going to talk about his relationship to a passage to India. No, no, that's later. <laughs> um, so Professor Holliday is the PBC for Teaching and Learning and uh, very supportive of the library in this space. So, I mean, I don't know what I'm supposed to be saying, but I'd say get a Kindle on your phone <laughs> so that you've always got at least 200 novels in your pocket and you get stuck on the MTR or you get stuck on a train or... For some reason, you find yourself with 15 minutes that you didn't expect to have. Your novel is there. You don't need to carry anything beyond what you're already used to carrying. It's, for me, it's transformed my reading habits in that I used to kind of not want... I, I never like to carry things. Um, I don't like to have... I never take a bag to the office or away from the office. Um, I like to be as kind of traveling, traveling as light as possible. So sometimes in the past, I would be stuck and I wouldn't have anything to read, and I'd be frustrated. Now that's never the case. 
as I say, I've always got my novel with me. So for me, that is getting the Kindle, Kindle app on your phone is, is just exactly the way forward. What did you actually want me to say? <laughs>